title for the session is Active Modes, the role of walking and cycling in sustainable urban mobility. So big topic, of course, and I would say that it may be part of the DNA of uh, Mobilize Your City modes. Um, maybe today, and that's a good thing, it really seems obvious to everyone. So you will go to any conference and of course the most important thing and most important mode is the active modes and everything that relates to NMT. Uh, back in 2014 and 15, for some it was obvious, but for many it was not the case. And if you look at early 2010s and earlier than that, very few people were talking about it at the time. Uh, most authority will focus on the transport infrastructure and maybe neglect the most important part. So it's great to see that the discussion and uh, the focus is shifting. Uh, but of course, we will see that there is still much more we can do when it comes to non motorized transport and active modes. And um, I think that will be our discussion for the next uh, 90 minutes. Uh, I will call David. To the stage maybe david i would like you to briefly introduce yourself because you have a, such a large wealth of experience but i think the audience uh, would like to know who you are before they, they hear from you thank you okay thank you very much uh, my name is david moncholi i am a spanish uh, consultant i work for idom and i have been able to to do a lot of transport planning uh, sustainable mobility planning uh, of course, active mobility throughout the world in, in my years of experience, basically in Latin America, of course, but also in Africa, Middle East, and a little bit in Asia. Um, so I have quite a quite a, a lot of elements in my mind and, and ideas on, on what we've been doing and quite, what can be done in terms of sustainable mobility. Um, my presentation, and I wanted uh, to highlight the title, it's uh, walk, and cycle, walk and Cycle City Challenge, because it is most of the times perceived as a challenge, uh, whether in a positive or in a negative way, uh, walking and cycling in the city. And I also wanted to highlight that we need to defy the impossibilities of urban design for pedestrians and bicycles in our cities. And you will understand why I call it. Uh, First of all, the walk and cycle provocation, because uh, honestly, in most of our cities, when we start talking about walking and cycling, most of the city stakeholders are going to look at us as if we are provoking them. What are you talking about? How come you're there? How are you there? I don't know if this sounds familiar to you, but we have a nice car, friendly car, who is just asking out loud, I would like to go from Hong Kong, China to Macau. This is something I would like to do. And suddenly the stakeholders, the governments, the industry respond. And we build the longest bridge in the world. It's uh, something like 50 something kilometers long, which is uh, 15 billion US dollars cost. We can make 10 Davao projects with the price of that. Uh, it's 400,000 tons of steel. Uh, it's enough to construct 60 Eiffel Towers, but it's also going to be able to resist uh, earthquake magnitude eight and typhoon magnitude, I don't know, 13, 16, and uh, impact of a 300,000 ton cargo vessel. So it's huge and we put all our efforts and nothing matters. I mean, we will do it. It's not a question of anything to be used by, remember this number, 6,500 cars per day. Uh, and then we can have this, this is Commonwealth Avenue here in Manila, huge amount of lanes, any lanes you want, you have it. This is actually a road in Dubai, 12 lanes per direction, no matter what. And then we have our friend in the bicycle and ask, can I get some space for my bike? Just for you to know, daily bicycle trips in Metro Manila it's not a big model share, it's only 2%. But here in Manila, we have 745,000 trips per day on a bike against 6,000 cars in, in the bridge. Or, and again, some, some pictures of Manila. I was coming with the metro today and I, I remember this super, super narrow area just out of Ortigas uh, MRT3 Avenue. And we have some pedestrians asking, can we fit in here? We have more than 10 
10 million daily trips by walk in Manila. It's only 30% of model share, but still 10 million trips, okay? Uh, this is uh, pictures I took in Mauritius. I was doing some planning in Mauritius. You can see all the pedestrians are waiting outside the sidewalk because there is no sidewalk. Or this is in Amman. I've been doing some planning in Jordan, Amman, in which you have some areas and you're walking and suddenly your sidewalk disappears and you don't know exactly what to do. And then we have, again, this kind of people saying, okay, what, what is our share of the raw space? Why, why I have only 10 centimeters width uh, when you have 12 lanes? And when we ask these questions, these nice cars becomes this angry SUV and says, stakeholders, city planners, you know, politicians, it's completely impossible. There is not enough room for bikes, not possible. You are going to cause enormous congestion. Technically not feasible. This is something like, like technically not feasible. Who is going to answer that? Uh, unless you are a technical. Uh, you will create safety issues for pedestrians. This is our day-to-day -day situation when we, want, when we want to plan walk and cycle. And I have three main ideas, three main lessons. I just wanted to make it very brief, but I think that if we all have this in mind, it becomes really easy to plan for walking and cycling. First lesson, yes, it's possible. It is possible. Uh, one example I'm proud of, I live in a city called Valencia in Spain. I was able to plan for the SUMP uh, some years ago, uh, and they implemented the SUMP. Uh, in fact, and this is true, whenever something is happening around mobility in the city, my mother would call me and she will ask me, is this your fault? And I say, yes, it is my fault. This is the uh, town hall square, the city center two years ago. This is how it looks like today. It was really tactic uh, planning, nothing really serious. You just took the cars away, make a huge pedestrian area, which is full nowadays. And now that this is the market square, again, two years ago, and this is how it looks like today. You just take the cars away and you make pedestrian city. All the areas, all the, all the shops and the, and the bars around, they have uh, seen an increase in sellings compared to the other, seat, other areas nearby. And this is proved by, by one bank. This is the, you see the cathedral, this is the Reina Square. And this is how it looks like now. So it is possible, but not only in Valencia, you know, in Europe. This is Kigali, was an example shown before. Uh, this is near the Imbuga City Walk and KN3 Avenue, where you have walking and cycling facilities and they have implemented it. This is also Dubai, in which I had the chance to plan for the uh, non-motorized non master transport plan in Dubai. It is really hot in summer. It is also very hot in summer in Spain. But we plan some actions to promote walking and cycling. This is what we envisaged. And they built it. They did it, especially on our pilot areas. They built it. And nowadays, one of our ideas was, why don't you put some parking facilities for bicycles near Metro? It didn't exist before. They did it, and they are full today. So as long as you put infrastructure for walking and cycling, we are not humans. We are not stupid. We will use it. Okay, so lesson one, it is possible. And no matter where, I mean, don't, don't ever tell me, but here the culture is different. No, we are almost the same everywhere. And if you want the will, it can happen. Second, and this is something really important, especially if you're traffic planners or you're civil engineers, I'm a civil engineer, uh, and we like, you know, heavy stuff, you know? We have to think on walking and cycling, and we need to think of all the needs this particular transport mode needs. So each transport mode requires its appropriate set of infrastructure. And so does walking and cycling. When we think on cars, we think on bridges and we think on tunnels and roads and parking spaces. When we are planning bicycles, why do we most of the times forget parking places for bicycles? Why? If we are using our bicycle to go for work or shopping or, or you know, for school, we need a place to leave our bicycle. This needs to be part of the infrastructure. So walking and cycling is not only bike lanes and sidewalks. It's a transport mode that must be conceived the same way. For pedestrians, for instance, shelter. 
shadowing against climate conditions in Odwif. I remember we did a, a master, a transport master plan, sustainable master plan in Brazil, in Sobral, and the sidewalk and you know the pedestrian plan also contain a plan, a plan to plant trees to make shadow because in Sobral, which is near the equator, you have the sun on top of you all day during all year. So the, the greening part of the plan, the planting trees, was an essential part of, this, of, this, of the walking plan. For bicycle, as I said, parking facilities, sufficient width, climate protection, etc. This is an example. You put parking facilities and they are full. This is here in Manila. You have shelters, uh, walkways when it rains, and here in Southeast Asia, it rains a lot. But if it's too warm, you have that in Mauritius, you put some shadow. This is something we do very often in Spain, in summer, in Madrid, in Seville, etc. We cover uh, commercial streets, it's very easy, so that during you know, heavy summer, um, you can be protected from, from sun. This is something that Qatar, Doha, just did very recently in a super modern, super wealthy part of the city. They did not forget of shadowing, or in Doha, Qatar, it is super warm. So second, second uh, lesson, important one is, don't forget all the elements that really are required for your transport mode to be successful. And just think uh, of walking and cycling the same way as you would think on cars or public transport, et cetera. Each transport mode requires its own, um, its own infrastructure. And the last one, the last lesson, uh, it's an upside down design, uh, or I call it the outside in design, and you will see why. You will, you will probably see in this, these graphs, but you know, the most two sustainable means of transportation nowadays still use one of the basic forms of energy humans, uh, which, you know, over the, the thousands of years, which is the human energy, which is walking and cycling. We have been walking since the beginning of our existence. And although cycling is a little bit more new or more recent compared to walking, it's also based on the use of body energy. So the use of space, the level of emissions, noise, the use of energy, all of these elements are completely unbeaten if we compare walking and cycling against other means of transportation. Uh, of course, some, some cities are super big to be walking, but still remember ancient Rome was 1 million inhabitants and everyone walked there or Baghdad, you know, in the, in the middle age. So there are the city where I come from in Valencia, which is almost a little bit less than 1 million, 50, 50%, 50 50% of all trips are done walking. In the city, it's a super compact city, and you know, walking is really encourageable. I told you, we've, we've, we've seen this kind of you know pyramid or inverse pyramid in which we want to you know reverse the priorities on how we plan, on how we share the urban space of our city. So instead of giving all the sp spaces for uh, vehicles and taxis, et cetera, we should give the vast majority of our, our available urban space to the most sustainable modes, which is walking, cycling. And then of course, if we need for long distance, we need motorized transportation systems. So let's prioritize public transport schemes, whether it's formal structure, uh, high capacity transport systems or more informal first mile, last mile systems as we saw this morning. And then if we have space, just give the space, the remaining space for, for private vehicles. In fact, uh, uh, this is something that we are also saying, you know, accessibility is a right that we have. We, we need really to access different places in our city because we need to perform different activities and accessibility must be granted whatsoever, but not accessibility by car, not necessarily by car. There is a, a lot of ways to grant people accessibility without the need of private vehicles. But instead of you know, this upside down, I prefer the you know, outside in design. So when we start planning our cities, our urban space, instead of, I will go back to this one because I like this, this first, instead of planning you know, from you know, the center to, the, to the, you know, the, the borders of the street, so I start planning with a lot of cars and then my parking facilities for cars. And then sometimes if I have some bus lane and, leftovers for bike and cycle, 
that will cause the picture I showed you before of you know Ortigas metro station here, in which you have something like 30 centimeters for pedestrians, and you have four lanes, four cars. So that is approximately 15 meters for car and 40 centimeters for pedestrian. If you plan your city this way, this is what's gonna happen. We should plan our cities the other way around. We should start you know, from facade, then think about the number of the, the meters, the width I need to really give sufficient space for pedestrians, sufficient space for walking. Then I should allocate probably some spaces for activities in the city logistics, my public transportation system, and if there are some spaces left, then why not? We should allocate cars. I mean, cars are necessary at some point. I mean, we are not against cars, but we are going against the you know illogic usage of cars. So if you plan like that, and this is a picture I like very much. So if whenever I think of, of any future in terms of mobility, and nowadays we are you know, being bombed by a lot of new mobility solutions that will solve, you know, finally will solve mobility. And you know, we, we are seeing a lot of autonomous vehicles that will definitely or I call them flying objects, you know, this kind of, you know, flying elements that would definitely solve mobility. I always use this KPI for analyze if, if that is the future I like or not. If I see in the future pictures they show me, if I see people walking and cycling around, this is the future that it's more likely to, look, to be successful and the, the future I like. If I see this is a picture from the 50s. If I see cars and I see people inside cars and I don't see anything around but only lanes, probably this is the future that we are not going, definitely I don't like. And definitely it's not going to drive us into the sustainability path of the mobility. So in any city in which urban space, walking, cycling, sitting down for chatting with friends, I remember once, uh, um, I was checking on some other examples of SUMPs when we were doing SUMP in Valencia, and I happened to 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 read the SUMP of Rotterdam. Rotterdam is a city in in the Netherlands, so it's nice landscape, etc. The the vision of the mobility in Rotterdam was that the city center was to be the saloon of the house, so the main room of the house. So people there were thinking of their city as your home and they were conceiving the city center as the living room of your home. The living room is where you invite family for celebrations, it's where you spend time watching TV relaxed, it's when you really have, it's one of the best areas in your house and they conceive the city like that. So they transform the city center in a way that citizen would feel like in a living room. I really like this vision. It has nothing to do with mobility, if you think of it. It's kind of a you know, living environmental, uh, urban environmental, you know? So these elements, so if we conceive our future in this way, in which pedestrians walking, cycling have their place, can really uh, uh, exist and coexist with the rest of motorized mobility, this is probably going to, to make us achieve our goals in sustainable mobility. The cities which are planned this way really use less energy, really use less space. The emissions that they, they, they make is really lower compared to other, other structures which rely on motorized transport. And don't tell me that you know your future is going to be electric. Yes, it's going to be electric, but I don't know if you're aware that electric cars, a good part of the emissions of electric cars come from the tires. And electric cars, they also have tires. So they will keep on making emissions. You know, the small particles will be a good part of the emissions of electrical vehicles, even if we take the engines out. So I hope that with my enthusiasm and my, my voice, I woke you up after lunch. Uh, I think that, you know, just to finalize that, you know, for us, for, for mobility planners, making SUMP and you know, promoting walking and cycling is our unique chance to propose a city model, it's a city model in which mobility takes place in a safe environment in an efficient, intelligent way. For me, walking and cycling is really ITS, intelligent transportation system. We use our head.
It's an opportunity to recover urban space for people and assure that mobility that, that the mobility needs are met while social and economical interactions are favored. It is deciding or helping, you know, deciders, helping politicians decide uh, what, type, what type of city we want. So do we want this 12 lanes per direction, sex road in Dubai, or we want this environment? This is Barcelona, but also Istanbul. Do we want this on the left? Again, Dubai. I don't know if you've been there. Uh, Dubai Mall is if not the biggest, one of the biggest shopping centers in the world. I was staying in that hotel, which is on the on the Arrow, to sit Dani, and it's something like 500 meters. You cannot walk to the metro station. No walking. You have to take a taxi because it's not possible to cross. Which mall do we want? Or this other? This is also Dubai after we started to implement the, the non-motorized transport plan. Full of bikes, full of pedestrian areas. As long as you put infrastructure at hand, people will start making use of it. And that's it. Thank you, Salamat Po, for, for you know, the locals. And I am you know, open to any questions that you might, might have. Thank you, David. Um... So I think we all know why we invited David to this session and why you're speaking first. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, you can take your seat and I will go to the other presentation and, and then have the, uh, the conversation. Um, I like the numbers that you gave us at the beginning. So the um, 6,000 cars was the most expensive bridge uh, on the planet or 10 million uh, trips uh, in Manila every day that are almost totally ignored. So the contrast uh, cannot be any, any bigger. Um, I think we all uh, have the three lessons that you gave us, and we'll keep that in mind, uh, that it's not impossible, so which means it's possible, uh, that we need to think the infrastructure, and infrastructure is not just road or metros. Uh, we need infrastructure for walking and, and cycling. And we remember your new world of inside, sorry, outside in uh, design. Thank you. Uh, now let me turn to uh, Deliani. Uh, so I will invite you uh, uh, to, to give us your presentation. I will also ask you to briefly introduce yourself so that everyone knows what is your current role and the experience that you have. Please, thank you. So yeah, so good afternoon all. Thank you so much for inviting me here. So I'm Deliani Siregar. I'm representing Institute for Transportation and Development Policy Indonesia or ITDP Indonesia. Senior Urban Planning, Gender and Social Inclusion Associate. Actually, I'm an, mostly of my works. I work for the cases related to active mobility and then kind of like mobility oriented development, low, low emission zone. Also kind of like a little more now chassis perspective. It's like, it's kind of like really uh, core issues that, uh, that we should like also uh, taking care of because of, yeah, it's really matters on us. And I, I also work in Indonesia, Azerbaijan and also Pakistan works in. So yeah, my presentation will also give you some of like, I really not really want to do give you a guidance or something. I just want to tell and just sharing about what we have done so far in Jakarta. If you already visited Jakarta a couple days ago or a couple months, couple years ago, maybe you will face it different if you just like come and visit Jakarta. So this is more about first and last miles connectivity. How can it be very important to be addressed? Because it will later on also give more people come into our public transportation, which is cities give most of the investment on it now. They really want to really taking care about sustainable mobility in the city. So yeah, we will understand about the issues and opportunities first. So in Jakarta, actually Trans Jakarta or the BRT system already established in 2004, but up to 2016, unfortunately, it's only 300 passengers per day. So 300,000 passengers per day up to June 2016. And based on our survey along the first corridor and sixth corridor of Trans Jakarta, the issues are related to the absence to the stations because of we also normally have the BRT in the main road 
but then there is no kind of like really options to go there because people from the residential area we only have like maybe two to three meters width of the uh the street so there is no kind of like really sustainable option modes to go to the station so most of the the considerations why they just like took the motorcycles which is now up to now they just like being the biggest mod share in jakarta it's up to seven motorcycles so they feel more convenient and it's because of easier for them start to from house to the the case of the up first last month so it's also talking more about the first last mile issues. It's because of most of people, because from our study in 2020, 2020, we understand that most of the vulnerable groups, they depend on active mobility. They really go and keen for walking or even more bicycle for children. And they mostly just like, go within the neighborhood less than five kilometers trips per day. But for most of Jakartans actually who will go with the public transport, they will cover more like 20 kilometers per day for home and from home to the office or the other kind of like destination in the city center. So it's really difficult at that time. Trans Jakarta have a very ambitious, ambitious strategy because they really want to get 1 million passengers per day, but they have no kind of like really um, the understanding on how they can do that. They just like like improving the first last month issues. So this is a very important. And um, besides that, it's also about the law enforcement being the issues because to talk to the so kind of like how to integrate policy and also the improvements happen situation to the police department for example because of based on our research in 2018 we got a number that 84 percent of the reports coming from the jakartan citizens they report some of obstacles to access this so this kind of like really interesting because of it's very difficult for us to access so when we work with the Jakarta cities, we really, really put, we, we want to understand about how we change ourselves. So maybe like you can think, uh, we work together with also the public operators at that time, we only have Transjakarta. But we have like, we also work with the other organizations, NGO, Academia, we work, uh, we work directly with the vulnerable groups and representatives, we work with the Jakartans. Yeah. Really not only limited to the technical assistance that we're given to the corporation, but we also work with them, like giving them a very good review because they always come to us just like bring the technical drawing and let us give comments on it. it we work really go with the, the needs of the vulnerable group, for example, or not. We give them also the assistance along the construction. Even we have like one week schedule to visit the construction site, just because to let them understand, because it's kind of like a multi-level um, understanding needed because of maybe the city level government, they, 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 they really understand about the principle, maybe they design certain then one who work in the field, they maybe not know why we should like keep the rams in number or even like uh, why we have to like make this kind of like sidewalk into with meters kind of things. So yeah, we have to like do this kind of like intensive work together with the. Then working with the community, we we also want to give this kind of like helping the citizen, giving help also to the government to let the people know about the importance of having this kind of like infrastructure because of well, we also having kind of like difficulties because of most of the city mayors they are politicians really care about the number of people who will give votes for him so uh, we should like also let the people know if he do something about the activity improving the 
picture. So it will also help people to do it. So most of this kind of like work, we collaborate with the NGOs and also communities, just like to let them understand. We do, do a lot of campaigns and also walking tours, just like to let them understand about the ideas on how good active movement. And this is kind of like things that we've done so far from 2017. So actually the, yeah, the point, the turning point is in 2016 and we have a very intensive working together. But then it's really important in 2017 when we finally do the site visit and technical assistance, right? Then we finally all the works together with the, um, the works agency with them finally we can like to, to wrap up with giving them a feedback through, through a guidance so we make a roadmap for 2017 to 2022 roadmap for the vision of so we call the document as really why we have to name it as an nmt vision because it's really interesting to understand that yeah, have vision i do not know how to like book out through the, the right um, the right sentence so we give him an alternative about it. so these guidelines give her very very detail about the principles and the designs element that that should be easy the width and then kind of like how many how many budget that should be prioritized per year of, of in, for the five years kind of things and in 20 18 actually ITDPP also do the working together with the, all the technical seats we work and giving the workshops and then training let them know about the tactical urbanism uh, approach because somehow they just like usually do not go with the implementation phase just because they worry to get more protests coming from people so we let them know about one of what that can be done which is give more spaces in between government and also the community just like to talk so the government can test design and also give fit to the design so we also introduced this kind of like approach and then in 2019 most of the physical in, in Jakarta may be led in 2018 where also there is a momentum actually because we being a host for the uh, Asian games so that's why the works finally can be adopted well by the government because government have to like with the city so all the principles all the guidance and the roadmap can be 29 to not only uh, about the junction not only about spaces in sidewalk and also bike but in 2019 we started their interventions. It's related to one of the pedestrian pedestrianization uh, improve most crowd in Jakarta. The, the name is Duku Atas. And after the improvement, we also share about the methods to be implemented uh, by the car. How to do the stuff? Will it impact? How then? really bring the narrative to be told to the people kind of things. Actually, in 2019, we also let the government learn co-design, co-planning and co-design process, where we also, like, as an ITDP, we work together with the 27 uh, neighborhoods. We call it Kampung. Uh, it's kind of like to urban village, urban neighborhood kind of thing. We work with the 27 kind of like process they want what kind of like in design so this is also a way why we want to people understand about the import having a good quality infrastructure for walking and cycling and from like dvds we also got that women uh, in this area in most of neighborhoods in jakarta Lead for the mobility. Unfortunately, they do not have it to be heard, to be contributed into planning documents. So that's why uh, we already like give this kind of like findings and like 
like let them understand what needs from the rest because of as they cannot like really shift from the motorcycles or motorbikes to walking because of it's really impossible for them to walk but for women it's like really hard for them to do the mobility or even get more opportunities in the city just because of they do not have any authority or chance to go to access the cycling or the bikes or even more the motorbikes and in 2020 actually we also improved one of the MRT Jakarta station we also work together with number of the elementary schools and based on our intervention in bike lanes actually we understand that there are more than 700 schools actually can be accessed. fortunately the population uh, produced by the city government and then in 2021 and 2022 we work together with city government just like to Please more and more create more accessible uh, bus stations. So this one is like a very funny story because we have uh, one of the big stations because our former mayor, they, he learned most of the cases from Bogota. So if you go to Jakarta, most of our BRT stations just like Bogota. Starting in like 2020, start to do redesign the access of the BRT station. So most of, no most of, but some of our BRT stations now access really improvement with the piece really cool and we're proud of but to this our assistance to government will put it in lesson learn we understand that this kind of like process is not true and it's not kind of like a bit. so we understand it's very long and continuous process and we as an we should like also declare that it's not kind of really just that we can do to organization itself, but we have to do like a very complete collaboration with other stakeholders and it's need big effort as maybe mentioned before maybe the infrastructures cannot as the public structures and somehow yet in an economical perspective somehow to like really calculate impact first just like to bring that this is sufficient enough to be uh to be yeah, to be funded by a very big uh, donor kind of things but so yeah it's kind of like really long discussions but we can see progress of your days like really oh yeah it happens yeah we need to go with it and then the second one is about the adoption to policies and regulations so somehow so maybe this is the one that I also taught, uh, taught to you maybe in the first day that this is a very interesting that some is coming also can binding the commitment of the government because of how when we already like give the Jakarta the roadmap, five, five, uh, five years roadmap, they cannot like really easily adopt document into the city regulation or city document just because of the roadmap. You like. Uh, somehow we we need like not only purchase the document or even like the planning document we also need to proceed with the MOU kind of things and it's a very long story so somehow we just like put the document as a recommendation and most of it depends on the political will but we usually do negotiation also discussions about how you can like really or the city can really adopt this kind of like recommendation so we also put it this kind of like policies and regulations also uh, related not only about the regulations about the physical also most about complementary policies because in Jakarta or most cities in Indonesia they tend to, to publish or produce more the attract people to attract people to go with walking cycling using the public transportation but they do nothing for the push policies so parking is kind of like issues uh it's easy for us to buy a cheap motorbike car kind of so it's kind of like really we need a support and maybe later on um, maybe it will also bridge you to another session this day because of will also lead a rationale why then people should because we have like 20 to 23 kilometers per day one trip from house to the destination why we have to shift if it's not accessible enough to uh, more sustainable transportation. So some of the rationale and discussions now also develop into 
how then people can go back to this live in city. And then maybe the, the, the takeaways, the two takeaways is about scaling up. It's how then Jakarta can transform itself because day by day, though we grow, we have a good things happened in Jakarta, but there are so many great things. Flaws to be, be um, fixed. Then it's also kind of like how then this kind of like good practices can be implemented directly created to wider area or even like other cities outside of Jakarta. So we work actually together with the Ministry of Public Works where we also have to finally, we started to work in 2021, but finally last year, uh, this year, sorry, on May, we finally uh, published, so the ministry published the ministerial letter for the national guidance on the uh, for pedestrian facilities so yeah so this is kind of like really interesting because of the talks also covered by so the regulation finally published it's not only because of us or even like our, our partners our colleagues coming from UN Women Indonesia or even like the organization from people with disabilities but we also work together with the society such as Jakarta Good like also the this is the community lead number of walking tours in the cities and we ask them to also sound or even like echoing our messages into something another kind of way so they they put this kind of like tourism perspective on walking and cycling as well so this kind of like really emphasis and help us so finally this kind of like regulation national regulation national guidance can Thank you very much, Deliani, and it's always so great to hear from a real life example. Um, so, and great to see the, the progress. I like your lessons on continuous effort. I mean, a, any topic under the MYC will take continuous effort. I remember Pablo this morning uh, telling us that we need to go gradually uh, when it comes to paratransit reforms. NMT is also uh, the case policy and, regul and regulation. Um, equally important, uh, and we've seen it's not just in Jakarta, but the cities that have uh, guidelines and standards developed, so it's a good thing. But then when it um, becomes uh, monetary to use it, and then you need to go to the beyond the policy to the regulation that will apply, um, people always forget that having rules makes everyone's life easier because you just apply the rule. Yeah, but it's not so easy to 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 have some, and the scaling up. I think it goes with a continuous effort, and the more you do, you the more you will be doing, and the bigger the the impact. Thank you very much, Deliani. Um, now it's time for uh, discussion. I will invite Faila to join us on the stage. Um, so that's an open discussion. Uh, Again, uh, everyone is welcome to participate, to ask questions, but also share observation or experience or challenges that you are facing in, in, your, in your city. Um, we'll start with the same question uh, to, to everyone and seek your views. Um, um, from ADB perspective, projects that promote non-motorized transport usually are public transport project and transit system, whether it's a metro or BRT. So we take the occasion of the project to do something uh, on the NMT side, uh, the minimum being the accessibility to the, to the station, everything that we say about the last mile connectivity and uh, the more ambitious projects will go. And uh, I'm looking at Imran and the uh, BRT project in Peshawar, where the project go to facade, from facade to facade and redevelop the public space along the, the corridor and even beyond uh, that. So we could say that the transit system, the new project is uh, gives an opportunity to work on the NMT and you can introduce this nice bike sharing system you can work on uh, developing these uh, bike plans and, and all this type of thing. What we have not seen, and I think that's the same for AFD and other lenders, um, at least from, uh, from ADB, we've not seen projects that are NMT projects per se. 
Um, so, and my question to you is how we could do uh, uh, this type of thing. And can we look at non-motorized transport, walking and cycling without having a transit system being developed? And um, how do you think we could do that and, and support our client country uh, and cities doing so? Um, whoever wants to go first, the only thing I know that I would like to hear from the four of you on this, but uh, whoever want, feels like uh, going first, maybe Harold or Faila, since we've not earned you. Harold, you're the one. <laughs> Yes, a few thoughts on uh, on NMTs and how to make them projects, uh, visible projects. Uh, just one example, uh, while working uh, recently uh, on a SUMP and discussing with stakeholders, uh, we had just fresh results uh, from the household survey, uh, giving the uh, amount and share of uh, walking in the city and just ask them uh, what was this amount, just, for, just as a guess and uh, as a play. It was in Abbottabad, actually, uh, with our Pakistan friends. Uh, the answer was, well, 20, 25% at most. Uh, it was over 50, ne next to 60, actually, uh, from the results of a household survey. So I often, put as a, an introduction to the actions uh, I put in a sump regarding NMTs, uh, NMTs are an invisible mode, are a shadow mode. So let's make the shadow in the sun, let's uh, draw the shadow in the sun actually, and let's, let's make this mode visible. And first, actually, uh, it's difficult to have projects because it's, First and foremost, difficult to understand that walking is just a mode and most often uh, the first mode just to get out of one's home, actually. Uh, so first step, actually, is to have this uh, understanding. And then I would say, uh, possibly with a bit of provocation, let's uh, have some massification of NMT. We have some massification uh, and mass projects uh, for public transport, and it's very good. Uh, let's understand uh, NMTs likewise. Uh, they are most often considered as very scattered projects, a small solution uh, powdered over the city. Uh, they are not, actually. They can be taken on the whole length of an infrastructure. They can be taken uh, on a whole neighborhood uh, level and can make a very relevant scale and size uh, for a project uh, to be built up uh, and to be discussed uh, with local stakeholders and be taken over the wrong run. So take a neighborhood, take a road, take a bunch of roads and uh, think over how you can make uh, NMTs possible, very matter of fact, putting sidewalks, having people to walk, et cetera, et cetera, get the people engaged and have some feedback. So I will stop here, but that's uh, make the invisible visible and make the scattered something massificate, massificated and we'll have a way forward. Thank you, Aro. Uh, uh, great suggestion. Thank you. Thank you. Very striking. Faila? Uh, in case of uh, um, Southeast Asian city, the world that uh, I've been working uh, with, we, we need to see um, the city development itself. We need to assess that. We have to be careful on what is the priority of uh, the work because um, uh, usually uh, cities in uh, Southeast Asia, they are scattered, uh, urban sprawling. For example, like in Jakarta, so 20, uh, the um, average trips is uh, 20 kilometers per day. So that's going to be very difficult to um, first introduce the uh, walking and cycling. So we, we need to have a good public transport system first. I, I see like cities, one city in Indonesia, the mayor really keen to develop a corridor sidewalk without any uh, 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 
public trunk system there. Then the sidewalk is uh, on the corridor, not uh, like a network uh, of. No one used that uh, facilities because um, people will use a uh, uh, private or motorcycle. When you use private car or motorcycle, you tend to go door to door. So the uh, and then pedestrian usually, uh, sorry, uh, passenger usually they work to the from home to the station and then uh, they take the public transport and from. Uh, the station of public transport, they go to their own, de their destination. So that is why, why we uh, utilize the sidewalk as well. But yeah, we need to see whether a good uh, transit system available uh, there or, or not. In case of like Paris, so uh, during the COVID, the mayor of Paris, you know better than me. <laughs> so yeah, she has a massive uh, uh, cycling uh, uh, improvement there. Um, yeah, because um, public transport maybe there is uh, already established. But in our cities, in Southeast Asian cities, so we need to introduce that first. And then second is, if we want to uh, directly implement the uh, working on cycling uh, project or network, we can start actually, still, there is a hope. <laughs> We can start on the old town, for example, the main destination, but built where people uh, enjoy um, um, the city. For example, like uh, Nguyen Hu in uh, Vietnam, Ho Chi Minh, uh, old town in Jakarta, something like that. You can start introduce from there and then develop your network. And the other uh, way uh, to build the working and staffing network is to have the roadmap. Um, yeah, so then uh, the investment will be not small, huge. So this is the roadmap and maybe with that roadmap, we can have like a staging. Okay, for first year, this kind of budget and with on this network that we can start and then, yeah, uh, developing uh, 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 countries or uh, cities, they can um, uh, start to uh, plan their self to implement that roadmap and like a, uh, 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 developing bank, we can help them as well uh, on this. Very interesting perspective. I will not summarize, there were so many things. <laughs> we want to hear from our, our other speakers. Um, maybe David, and you already touched upon this in your in your in your presentation. So uh, we already know that you are convinced that we can have an MT walking uh, and cycling pro without having pretext of a public transport project. But uh, still, I would like to hear you, or maybe you can tell us a, a bit more, or maybe give us example of initiatives that are purely NMT driven. Yes, actually, uh, I was thinking of it, and and honestly, many of the projects in which in which I have worked were dedicated NMT projects without the without the you know the the rest of the public transport pretext. I like that, um, and I also and so so yes, you can do it. One main example, you know, in in the city of Valencia, it was the case. SUMP, it's a document with five hundred pages, but it has about 300 pages dedicated to uh, walking and cycling. And it's full of projects only for walking and cycling. Uh, and the idea, and I am going to catch two of the ideas that, you know, Harold and, and our colleague, um, uh, yeah, Paira has said, because I like that because they were really in my mind. On one side, uh, you have to make pedestrian and cycling visible. I studied civil engineering, traffic engineering, transport planner, we are all used to seeing traffic volumes on a map. Many cities in the 60s, you will have a map and you see the traffic volumes. I don't know if you've ever seen pedestrian volumes on a map of a city. You do as UMP, you do surveys. First of all, you realize a big amount of people walking, but if you represent that on a map, specific map, it's a complete different point of view of your city. You understand the city in a complete different way. In fact, when we pictured walking trips in the city of Valencia, 
it is it is not on a corridor base. It's more like little stars happening in many neighborhoods. You know, walking trips are normally short distance, and this helps you identify where to plan, where to start intervening in your city. I would do that in Jakarta, for instance, 20 kilometers, no one is walking 20 kilometers. But if you picture, if you put a map on the walk trips in Jakarta, you will definitely see that there are quite a lot of areas which are, it's a completely different map from, you know, traffic volumes. So one side you have to picture it. And the other, and the other thing you said, Farah, it's super interesting, is the concept of network. In Valencia, where I live, before SUMP, there were already 100 kilometers of cycle uh, lanes in the city. Uh, and model share for bikes was about 2% of all trips. We built 30, 30 kilometers more uh, in the last year, so only 30% more. And now model split is more than 8%. What happened? The previous 100 kilometers were isolated each other. There were corridors, there were initiatives. The 30 remaining kilometers created a network. And this is exactly the way we conceived pedestrian mobility in the city. It is a network of priority or pedestrian corridors and a lot of squares, places in which pedestrians can stay, can sit, can shop, can enjoy the city. So pedestrians also need a kind of a network in which squares and uh, corridors are essential. So these two elements, if you try to put them together, and, and try to analyze which areas of the cities needs connectivity and needs uh, visualization. This is the basis to, to easily come up with projects for pedestrian and for cycling that are not going to be att attached to public transport at all. They don't need to be attached. Of course, if we focus on accessibility, first mile, last mile of public transport, this is a first step, of course, but yes, it can be done without the pretext of public transport, if you think or if you plan your city this way. Thank you, David. Uh, and listening to you, uh, it becomes obvious that uh, walking and cycling is a transport mode. So it can be planned like any other transport mode and have its own infrastructure. Because the methodology you describe is the one that is applied for bus routes and all this. So same methodology for all uh, transport mode, the only thing is the uh, that we need to acknowledge that walking and cycling. I think in this room we will agree on that, so maybe we'll uh, need to continue to advocate for it, but yes, it's a transport mode per se. Uh, Deliani, uh, same question. I know a lot of things have been said, so maybe you would like to, to share more observation on um, uh, active modes being a transport uh, mode and how it can be developed without public transport project. Actually, it's really interesting because I agree well, most of because of its most of Indonesian cities, um, the active mode is about the networks because of is when we say that we are love the corridor. Really connect the streets. Streets or roads with some of like certain classes related to like create our street as a shared street kind of like intervention or to one along the corridor how that we can really have awareness on how wall to wall uh, room or spaces for more sustainable moods but then. The interesting things maybe we should like also bundle it with a um, land use because of it somehow put in we have this kind of COVID network we can we'll not only limit it to five make it in a certain like staging or phasing as we maybe uh, talk about also whether if we link to the development 
we have number of with the urban region and really really big projects but then the city do not think about we once again the complete network to fit with the plan so they just like think of one side we will do some of urban regeneration so we will do some intervention only with that side but do not think about the side can pick yeah once again maybe <coughs> Yeah, the NMT projects can be seen as a massive, seen also as a legible, legit project. So maybe it can be, be uh, a project with a complete approach on the network as a city scale network. City scale approach is um, yeah very interesting to you. Thank you, uh, Mark. I have a question. The the screen has gone black, so I'm just trying to be cautious of the time. I know we still have time, but uh, just to get uh, to get an idea. Thank you. Uh, we are, so we have plenty of time. Twenty minutes. Thank you. Uh, um, yeah. Any observation or question to our speakers? And uh, I know there will be a lot of hands up. Elizabeth, please. It's a very in the weeds question, uh, David. I think we all have a sense of how you track, you know, uh, uh, car transport, bus transport, vehicle transport. How do you begin the process of tracking pedestrian movements? And you said, oh, you can map it and you can see the points and the corridors. How do you how do you actually do that? Uh, short of interviewing thousands and thousands of people. Well, nowadays. Thanks to technology, we are getting more possibilities of information. Yeah. <laughs> now, nowadays, we are, we're doing two types of types of tracking. I mean, the, most of us will definitely have Wi-Fi enabled, and we forget to switch it off. So we are tracked everywhere. So you, depending on on the on the size of the project that you are going to work on, depending on whether it's a small area or larger area, you would put some devices which will detect. Uh, your device, it's, an, it's, it's not your information, it's just an ID uh, and it will detect the concentration and it will detect your path at some point. This is, you know, pretty usual nowadays. And depending on the country, this, is, this technology is available actually everywhere, but depending on, on each country, depending on, on the, you know, regulations, etc., it is becoming more and more uh, common to use mobile data uh, information from bigger movements. It is really well developed nowadays in Latin America, in Spain and parts of Europe. It is becoming more available in other parts. Again, depends on the regulations, but you can have really like a lot of information on movements. And if you really split your OD matrix in terms of speed, in terms of, you know, the, the, the pattern that you have while walk, I mean, while moving, you will have quite a lot of information regarding pedestrian or pedestrian, especially pedestrian mobility without the need to have a huge survey, which is going to, hit, to be super expensive. So this is more or less nowadays how we are addressing that. So the, the contribution of the digital technology the, to the mapping, Sasang, please. Thank you, that was really, three things that kind of occurred to me. One is the visibility of the, the modal share. Um, maybe just between us as friends, we should have 16, because we have 16 completed sums, 16 clear modal share in um, the Mobilized Your City database because we're using the Mobilized Your City methodology. But 10 of the cities, only 10 have modal share for walking. Right? So even though we put this into our terms of reference, the data is not there. Where it's being collected, you can see that up to 60% of trips, like you said, are being made by foot. And it's around average of 40%, which kind of, I think, feels correct for people who are living here. So that makes me, I can't disagree with you more about saying first we can do transit and then. I don't think it's an either or option. And I think there are many, many cities don't have the population, the density, the finances for mass public. 
really to prioritize this this active mode, I think, is is really important. So there's this really this making the the invisible mode visible. I think is very very important. I think the question that you're asking, how can we? cities. And I think the interesting question in the more modal retention, you know, some of the examples that you were saying is this car wants to move and there's a lot of places moving, but a lot of people are waiting to get onto a bicycle or, you know, get onto a motorbike. So how do we keep the people who are walking still like positive about walking and not thinking I have to Third question, I think, what you asked uh, about uh, what could IFIs potentially do, and I, that was mentioned before, I think it would be really interesting. There's a huge, um, from Brussels perspective, a demonization of roads, but there is also a deficit of roads in a lot of secondary cities, I mean, especially in Africa, but also in places like Laos, and Cambodia, rural uh, Rajasthan. And when we do finance those roads, how can we do complete roads? So maybe like urban road projects can be become less taboo and we think about them as more complete streets, green streets, street shaping. Um, so that would be maybe like some of the advocacy. Roads are not inherently bad. It's the of roads. I could not uh, agree more with your last point. Uh, of of course, a road is a road, a street is a street, so it has a name. But it's the way you present it and the way you design it. Uh, uh, complete street. So it's a different story because uh, it has everything uh, in it. And uh, one of the reasons why I asked this question is um, that is a discussion that we are having internally. Uh, so uh, we've heard from Kenzo yesterday, he's the director for smart mobility. So we are trying to uh, do new kind of project. Uh, you heard Jamie, <laughs> so he's emerging area. And we see NMT as uh, an emerging area because it has been neglected somehow. We see that all kind of cities could benefit from a program that will improve um, the street uh, citywide. So you have an impact at scale. Whether you have a public transport system in place or whether you don't, uh, there are some cities in China or in India where uh, you have beautiful metro system. And uh, India or in China, we see that sometimes they are not, the ridership is not at the level that was expected or planned because many things are missing. And if you invest um, two or $300 million and redo your street and make sure that everything is there, including the accessibility to this metro system that is um, uh, uh, not popular enough, you will see that things will change. And But it's not a, a public transport system project because it's uh, uh, redoing the streets in your, in your city and you can do so many other things. All cities have schools. So you may have, and we've heard a bit of it in Jakarta, but you mentioned Paris and Paris, they, they've redone 300 streets um, in Paris um, so that are uh, fully pedestrian now, and so you have better access and safety to the, to the school within the city. So you can include so many things in this project. So I was asking the question, but I already had a view, and, uh, and that's also uh, internally what we think. So when we are starting to do new project, it can be a kind of new project that, will, and that could have an immense impact cities and livability. Not talking about climate, of course, when you're walking, you're just breathing. <laughs> uh, not talking about gender, but everything that relates to better accessibility, universal design also, and um, the design with uh, this participatory approach where all groups have a word to say, we live to, to better city. Thank you. Thank you, Sasan. Um, other question? Yes, Matthias. Glad to see that everyone is very much inspired by this topic. Okay, I think now it's working, okay. Um, yeah, thank you all so much for this inspiring session and for your contributions. Um, from my side, also just maybe another observation because the Walk 21 conference was just taking place about two weeks ago in Rwanda and Kigali. 
uh, that was a very inspiring conference as well, showcasing a lot of development on, on the continent. I would like to come back to the picture of the sun, like kind of bringing light into hidden mode of walking. Uh, the sun is, however, um, going up across the whole globe, so not on every city individually, and it's quite interesting. Uh, analysis that Walk21 did, and they understood or analyzed that currently about 108 countries in the world do have a walking strategy in place at the national level, um, while at the same time only a quarter of it, like 26%, um, of these strategies are actually underlined with budget, right? So, so still, this is kind of a very promising approach, I think, to bring light into it, to, to link walking at different policy levels, um, to lobby for funding. And um, yeah, what was also uh, interesting about the African continent was then at one and program. Um, about an inspiring action report. So walking and cycling in Africa. So they got together a lot of inspiring activities from different countries, different cities, and that really helped to, to gather some general figures, like, right? So like um, getting out these numbers. So the population in Africa is about 1.4 billion people. And they found out by different analysis and, and merging the different numbers that about 1 billion people, so that's again like 70% or so, is walking at least one hour per day. And I mean, this is a compelling case for any city and even an argument with these kind of numbers, um, even before having data on a specific city, I think they must be convincing somehow. And yeah, it would be interesting to hear um, also how we can get that together. And I think bundling uh, or looking into NMT strategies as parts of SUMPs and then seeing, okay, how much investment is actually needed to, to transform a city it could be a compelling case and um, KFW, so from the German uh, perspective, we've just, uh, I'm aware of one case. So now KFW is looking into providing uh, a grant in Euro for the city of Windhoek. And that's going to comprise like uh, the whole phase one of the NMT strategy over there. That's quite some considerable, yeah, change of, of streets with uh, hundreds of kilometers of streets transformed. So that's kind of, yeah, something worthwhile mention would be interesting to see whether the region of thank you matthias and uh, yeah it's great to see all this in, and we need numbers of course because it makes it easy easier when we go to to decision maker and when uh, all this initiative to be validated and, and it's also interesting to have numbers when it comes to the uh, capex that is required and you will notice that these interventions are not necessarily very costly uh, we've heard also the tactic urbanism approach that is a great approach so you do it it's temporary you do it with temporary material uh, and if it works it's fine then you can make it uh, permanent and if it doesn't, you just go back to the way it was or you do something, uh, something else. So there's a variety of things that we, we can do in that front and, uh, and be innovative. Uh, forgot to mention, yeah, and we forgot to mention also listening to you say, uh, so all these people working 60 minutes uh, a day. So we listed the other benefits on the NMT. There is a question of public health behind this as well, because um, being two hours stuck in a car or walking, uh, being working for one hour a day makes a difference on that front too. Reda, do you have a mic or no? Got it. Okay, thank you for the very interesting session. Just uh, wanted to comment on uh, in AFD, we have currently. Uh, couple of uh, pure NMT programs, including uh, one in uh, Madagascar capital, Tanana Reef, and uh, some street shaping, uh, loans for street shaping that are uh, mostly targeting, uh, I would say, uh, street shapings and also uh, trying to do for complete street NMT. And in that cases, systematically, we have infinite argument with the traffic management department, with the road management department of the cities, about what is the shaping that we want and what is the, the, the profile of the streets and uh, the prioritization of modes, which uh, led, led me to the, 
I mean, advocacy, that is, uh, that, that, that uh, this kind of program uh, need really a, a very strong political ownership. And this is a hard ownership uh, uh, because you have, I mean, reluctances that are, that are clear from car owners, etc. Uh, but, um, and also my second point is that I think that uh, I live in Paris and uh, we can see in, in, in most of Western European cities, there, there, there have been a, a big paradigm, sh paradigm shift in the last five to seven years. I think in Paris, we never had such a fast modal share changes for the last 17, seven zero years uh, than we had in the last uh, five years with the, the, the rise of walking and cycling because we had a, a very aggressive uh, and ambitious policy uh, from the, the mayor of Paris on this. And this is probably inspiring for uh, some cities in, uh, in, in Asia and, and around the world. But there are a few maybe uh, dead angles that I wanted to ask your opinion on. So first, uh, um, we see uh, walking, cycling, and public transport as uh, friends uh, in a sustainable mobility strategy, which is true, but to a certain point. Uh, we can see now a lot of um, tension between walkers, cyclers, and also with our uh, public transport company uh, in Western, uh, uh, in, let's say, in European cities, because uh, Bus commercial speed has uh, low down a lot uh, from 14 to nine kilometers per hour uh, due to intensive cycling. And because they are, uh, uh, I would say, uh, globally, uh, uh, the social contract among street users has changed. And uh, it comes to, to, new, to new contractual situation among workers, cyclers, uh, PT users, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, do you have example where uh, we can uh, of how to deal with that and what what kind of uh, successful program has been shown? And maybe another one is about commercial urbanism, because uh, new uh, um, I say street profiles those probably benefit to the shops and uh, and uh, commercial areas, but they are not the same. So if you're a car street. You won't say the same thing on it than a, a Walker Street. Uh, so do you have also examples uh, of how to tackle this? Uh, because it has actually a social impact for, for shops. Thank you, Reda. Great question. And uh, good to note that uh, AVD is ahead of the others and already have an NMT program. Yeah, uh, yeah, that, <laughs> that's a good start. Uh, yeah, the question on the conflict. So conflict among operators, think stakeholders, but also among users with these new um, ways of, um, uh, of mobility in the city. Who would like to take that question? Paella. So, um, um, yeah, so um, of course, uh, based on the new paradigm, uh, pedestrian is on the top position. Um, so, um, and then we have a, a problem as well in in uh, Jakarta actually when um, this is case in Jakarta that and maybe other uh, in other uh, project as well uh, BRT project when we try to introduce at grid crossing and uh, there is a a concern on uh, this will stop the bus, um, uh, but um, on the we have to know the priority, and I think like uh, we need to also uh, now people are, are uh, discussing about the fifteen minute cities, fifteen minutes uh, walking, and then forty minutes with uh, public transport. So that can be also designed uh, if we have. Um, Maybe the, the solution is we have a um, certain uh, a mark on our lane where the, the yeah, because uh, they, they can be uh, mixed together, it will be dangerous and then it's gonna interrupt each other. So if uh, we can do that, um, pedestrian have uh, their own separate uh, lane for pedestrian and then, uh, cyclists, their own have uh, their own cyclists, like in the Europe, in in Netherlands. So the the cyclist is amount is huge, and sometimes it's endanger the pedestrian, right? So maybe the separation is also needed 
uh, between these uh, stakeholders, like um, our road users. That's the first, um, maybe the first answer for me. Uh, the question is on the, um, uh, if there is um, um, road uh, changes from car to pedestrian, that's um, actually a, a big challenge as well to uh, convince, is that the question? To convince the uh, business like shop owner or something like that, that maybe showcase from um, lesson learned uh, that we can, um, and uh, again, stakeholder engagement um, in, and monitor impact, um, how this uh, new, um, a development will beneficial their uh, businesses, something like that. Uh, we can take from another uh, lesson learned from others, and then there's um, there should be a lot of consultation as well. Uh, what is their concern, and then we try to address their concern, and then monitor the impact, uh, um, report to them. Oh, this is before, um, and then also ask them how this um, new development, like, uh, for example, the construction of pedestrian benefit your, whether it's benefit your business or not, and then we can work together. So it will not stop on the construction, but after that, we, we also need to monitor. I hope that answer your question. <laughs> So actually related to the conflict one, so it's really interesting because of recently we also, it's not about they angry, gets angry to us, but they ask us more questions for the Transjakarta operators because most of the directors know us how then you can really ensure the design can mix well or uh, fit well with our designs for the bus because of most of the drivers now should like taking another new training because they cannot like, because of in most of main corridors in Jakarta now we have sidewalk. We have uh, services PRT, so we have like so the drivers know some of the drivers should take the training on how they can drive. Because of that training, the directors ask us go hand in hand and between uh, Then we uh, answer because actually we already submit our fully recommendation. That's because of what I mentioned before. The city somehow do not report or even like submit the full picture of the cities, the network should be, and also the detailed designs um, and how it with the issues. So the more and more issues and also conflict just because of the operators do not know how then should the design should work or should be implemented in the right way just because of maybe the transport agency or even like the the public works agency they work with some of like adjustment that they think it's a good adjustment but then it doesn't looks like it's a good adjustment it will also like lead into some of like issues such as the safety issues this kind of like conflict can be us should like go to the left side and then it will cut off the the bike lane being very dangerous for the cyclists to pass on. So they do not fully implement the design. And then maybe related to this kind of like, yeah, to, to solve this kind of like, uh, you just because of we need to all that should be implemented because it will also lead to make opportunity or even like we already done space after before area improvement we can pick us up solving so the the plan uh the implement solving the network they cannot like pick the residential do not be served by Port or cycling uh, facilities, so that's why they cannot go to the area. Even more, we already improved the 
the, the, the area with the more pedestrian and go significantly different and go well just because of the networks haven't been implemented. what you say and i think the question is a very good one because everyone is very much inspired and there is no one answer to that i like what you said about the um, awareness uh, because if you have new streets and new usage and new possibilities um, it, having conflicts um, is a natural thing because people don't know so everything that will relates to awareness campaign new street that we have, why is designed this way and how you can use it. Um, also, you can go uh, to how to behave uh, uh, there. The trainings uh, also are important. So you have a new system, new configuration. So of course, it's new to people. So maybe this is an aspect that should not be uh, neglected. Uh, I'm very pleased with this conversation. We are um, out of time now. The time is up. Uh, for by a few minutes. We will have a break so we can continue the discussion before I let you go. And I know it's not a planned question, but I know you will be able to answer that. Um, if you have one or two minutes and you need to convince a mayor that the city should invest in non-motorized modes, cycling and pedestrian, you have one or two minutes. So what would be uh, the key argument you would put forward? And I will ask David first because I know he does it every day. <laughs> I do it every day, but I haven't been asked this question so straightforward. But uh, I will I will say to him, uh, and I liked one of the comments there, I would say to him, uh, it's best value for money. So every euro, every currency that you invest in walking and cycling is really going to, to be worth it uh, in in a, in a greater extent uh, against other transport modes, and there is a lot of evidence on that. And you are going to make your citizens happier. Therefore, you're going to have more voters. So yeah, people's project more cities as a little place for people, so you will get more good public acceptance, so you will get more voters. I would say him, you, you have a new network at hand. Maybe you never thought of it, but it's free, it's fair, it's good, so go to it. That's a very best deal. I try to be different with the others because it's already taken. So if you want to have your city more beautiful, and then your your um, uh, voters will enjoy your city, the city. So yeah, make a more uh, pedestrian network. There is no other way. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much.